When I first started my YouTube channel almost five years ago, one of the first videos that I released was the story of my R34 Skyline GTR. That car became the Too Fast to Furious GTR. So there's a long story about that. And because I've added more than 200,000 subscribers since the first video about this car, I decided it was time to go over this car. Again, people want a chance to understand the story of the car and what is going on with those cars now because there were more than one GTR in that movie, the stunt cars and the backup cars. So if you already saw the first video I did on this car many years ago, you'll still want to see this videos because there are new developments and a couple of big ones that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. So we're going to get the updates on this car, tell you how everything started and how it ended. We're going to get to that right after this message. I don't know if you know this, but I actually now have a merch store. And if you haven't checked out the video description below my videos, then you're missing out. Currently, I've got a pack full of movie quote t-shirts and more styles are being added every month and new items are in development right now. So have a look, see if there's anything you like and wear it with pride. The link is in the video description below. So let me do a quick recap on how this car wound up to be cast in Too Fast and Too Furious. It's an interesting story and it took me by surprise to be honest. I bought this car from Motorex um, soon after I got my Supra back from the first Fast and Furious movie. I thought after that first movie that I was done working with Universal and I just went on my life and I said, well, what's next after a Supra? a GTR. So I bought a GTR. In fact, in the months after the first movie was released to the public, Paul Walker and I were traveling to different cities all over the West Coast to promote the Fast and Furious movie. During that time, Paul and I got to be kind of friends and we talked about cars, about Supras, and I did talk to him about GTRs. I think Sean Morris had had a couple of conversations with him and that was going good. And eventually, Paul and I both went to Motorex at the same time, just kind of look around at GTRs. There was a black GTR other, which was the Blackbird. I looked at it and I liked it, but I hate black cars. Always have, always will. But Paul looked at that car. He said, yeah, black is too much good care. He looked at a white one, a silver one. I'm pretty sure he bought one of the silver ones. There's a famous picture with him, his grandfather with that car. Anyway, after that, we went our separate raids and I didn't talk to him again until we started working on Too Fast to Furious. I want to make it clear that I had, I had no idea that they were going to make Too Fast, Too Furious. I didn't buy that car to put it in the movie. That was not my plan. It was not even a dream in my head. I just bought the car because I want that car. That's the way it was. And then the wheels started turning. So Paul didn't want to wait for his GTR because it was on order. So basically what happened is Motorex said, okay, Paul, you can borrow the Blackbird and drive that for a while until your car comes in. This is what got everybody convinced that Paul Walker owned that car before because while he was driving it, some guys who were doing a DVD, they talked to him and filmed him and he was driving that car. That car was actually my car, but not yet. I told him I wanted the car, but I didn't give it a toss. But anyway, my GTR V-Spec, the Blackbird, was the first fully legal GTR in the United States. So it was never at risk for confiscations because it was totally legit. The car was known as the Blackbird, as I said. I paid $78,000 for the car. You can go on the GDR registry and take a look at the 14 cars that did come through Motorex legally. There was 14 to 16 cars. That was the first one. So it was totally legit. And if somebody is telling you something else, they're wrong. I had big plans for this car. I wanted to make it a SEMA show car. I showed this car at SEMA in the HRE booth before I even started doing modifications and the car was still black. After that, I started to kind of play around with the car with the goal of putting this car in magazines and doing marketing kind of things. That's what I was doing back then. Having done that with several other cars before this, including my Fox Body Mustang and Apollo SS and a couple of other cars, this was my jam and that's what I wanted to do. So I knew that the first legal GTR in the United States would probably be a good marketing tool for all these magazines and for the parts that go on them. So I started building the car. This car was my most complex build to date. First, I painted a special candy blue 
This was a custom color based on a Lamborghini Diablo color blue. I don't remember the name of it. You have to call my body shop, so I'm not gonna give you information about that. You can call them. Why didn't I keep it black? Because magazines don't put black cars on the covers of magazines. When you're walking through the grocery store and you see all these car magazines on the rack, none of them have black covers. You know why? Black doesn't catch your eye. You have to think how a magazine publisher thinks. When you walk through the store and you come to the magazine aisle, you'll see all these yellow cars, red, orange, purple, green, because those bright colors attract your eyes there. And then you walk over there and you'll open up the magazine because you had a cool looking car in the front. And they said, yeah, I want to see more about this. That's how they sell magazines. As a matter of fact, if you have a black car on the magazine rack and a red car right next to it in another magazine, it's 30 times more likely that you're going to pick up this magazine and ignore this magazine. Facts, data, hard data. And of course, after I got my car painted blue, I put a red stripe on it. The red stripe was inspired by the signal auto livery. The two circles on the trunk was a quick fuel spout. Take a look at this picture right here and you'll figure it out right away. At the first, it was just cosmetic, but it was going to have a fuel cell. I was going to do the audio video for a year and then do the, the car all over again, strip it down, bride seats, get rid of the nitrous system. Well, not the stuff under the hood, but the car was going to be a dual purpose car. And so that was the initial plan, but it didn't get that far. So once the car got painted, we got to work on the rest of the car. We started with upgraded turbos, which were initially IHI6s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But one had had a problem, so we switched to HKS 2530s. Those seemed to work pretty well. While we were doing that, we put a custom 150 horsepower direct port nitrous provided by a company called Nitrous Express, which was a great company. I think they're still around. At the same time, we also decided to do a new intercooler and we use one of the Nitrous Express intercooler spray bar, which is installed in front of the intercooler. The concept, if you didn't know, if you blow in the ice cold air onto the intercooler, it helps keep uh, the engine cooler. Basically, it allows you to make more boost and, and cooler intake tips. And that's a good thing on a turbocharged car. Soon the engine bay was but full of eye candy everywhere I was looked. I was buying stuff from all over the world from the Group M Carbon Kevlar airbox, which I think is uh, 2,500 bucks back then, and to the genuine Nismo strut tower, which was $1,500 back then, and now sells for $14,000. Anytime I popped a hood at any car show, it always would bring a crowd. It was a mess, and I had to, sometimes I couldn't even get near the car. That's what I want to do. Everybody wanted to take magazine shots and all that kind of stuff. Stop Tech created 50 inch brakes for the car for the front and 14 in the back hre custom built a, set, a custom offset for their 446 r wheel to fit on the car a custom roll cage was crafted from my friend who used to work at ibach and he's in uh, utah now uh, so he did a great job with that and by this time the car was starting and getting attention of the magazines. I think I was in three or four magazines uh, just even before the car came out in Fast and Furious. I was winning trophies at car shows and all that kind of stuff. And that was kind of fun thing because it was a very different time. And then just about this time, Universal announced that there would be a sequel to the first Fast and Furious movie. And I'm like, what? Okay, well, I can't even imagine what the story's gonna be. By this time, it was early 2002. This is when Universal called me in the early of the year and they actually confirmed that they are indeed wanting to do a sequel. No one was more <laughs> surprised than I was. I, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Again, Universal called me back and said, can we talk and all that kind of stuff. They hired me basically to facilitate the designing and the building of the tuner cars to use in the movie. But first we had to talk about what cars are we going to use this time. New cars were coming out. Some of the other cars were getting long in tooth. And that's the first thing we did at my first meeting. When I was in there with the movie's director, John Singleton, and the production team, I was told that they had already found the, the main car for the movie. And the lady across from me said, we have a lovely car. We have Dodge Neon SRT for lined up for Brian's car. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> the woman, she was part of the production crew. Her name was Melissa Crollo. I will never forget her, who at the time was in charge of product placement and marketing. So product placement works like this. Let's say you have a product and you want to see your product shown on screen in a movie. You can do one of two things. You can call up the product placement department or 
In this case, the marketing department, which was Dodge, who said, we want to put our cars in your movie and then produce commercials all about the Dodge Neon SRT as, as featured in Fast and Furious 47, right? That's what they wanted to do. And what they're doing with Dodge, Dodge is with Vin Diesel, right? Dodge wanted to get their car in the movie in a big way. In return, Dodge would produce TV commercials to promote the movie starring the Dodge Neon SRT4. Now, I was sitting at the table with John Singleton, two seats down, and I'm, I'm writhing in my seat. I'm like, oh no, goodness. And Singleton looks him over to me, goes, Lieberman, you got something to say? I said, no, John, I'll wait my turn. And he go, grabs me and he says, listen, Lieberman, I don't want no booty ass in this movie. If this is booty ass, you need to tell me right now. Swear to God, that's exactly what happened. My other boss grabbed me on my wrist. <laughs> I was pretty sure I was gonna get fired. I strenuously objected the notion of inserting Dodge Neon, which up to then was a cheap rental car with no reputation of being a performance car. It just didn't fit. So as everyone calmed down, I was rolling through my head. What can we, what, what else does Dodge have? What, how can we make Dodge happy? I said, why don't we put some Dodge Vipers in there? Because we have a scene that we need bad guys on the freeway. Dodge Vipers would be great. How about Dodge Ram trucks? We're going to need that for the warehouse thing. That's the way Dodge got started in, in the Fast and Furious franchise. With all of that settled and ha Dodge is now happy, we needed to to pick the cars for the actors. Which actor is going to drive which car? It has to fit the personality. And that's not easy if you know some of these guys. So I showed my uh, food chain of JDM cars, no big surprise. You got the Skyline GTR, Acura NSX, the Mark IV Supra, maybe Mark III, FD RX-7s, 3000 GT VR4 would be great. Then we looked at other cars like the Imprezas. The rector wasn't really excited by the Impreza. WRX STI was not in the United States yet. The 350Z was not in the United States yet. It was close. S2000s, which were always great cars, especially in, in that context. And then we looked at Mitsubishi Eclipses. There was a new Mitsubishi Eclipse that had come out, the third generation. We also took another look at 300 ZX Z32s, which would have been nice. I really liked those cars. I really wanted to get them in the movie. It just They just didn't get excited about it. Somewhere in their process, Nissan North America heard about this movie, and they sent it over a marketing guy, a rather unpleasant fellow. A he was actually acting angry that we asked him to put one of their cars in the movie. And I was like, well, fine, don't do it. I don't give a We already have a Nissan. What? That might, that's car over there. But I'll tell you this, if that guy was a prick and they put 350Zs in that movie instead of the GTR, I can't imagine how many 350Zs would sell when that movie came out. But it was not to be. So if that guy still is working there, you should find that ticket. Cars were basically picked. Uh, the, there was a little flipping, flopping, all kind of kind of stuff. Some of the cars they wanted to change. Like I said, it was difficult to make everybody happy. Another thing that was going on is the guys who work in the picture car warehouse really like muscle cars. So. We had one point an accurate NSX was going to be one of the main cars during the barrel race. And the other car, I think, was, what was it? Toyota MRS wide body, I think we were going to do. But my boss jumped and I said, no, 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 no. We're going to do a Dodge Challenger and a Chevrolet Camaro. And I had no power to change that because all them old white guys, that's all they like, man. They, they like them big V8s and four barrel cars, four on the floor, all that kind of stuff, blah, 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 blah. However, they still needed a good tuner car for the second part, because remember, they, they drive the G, GTR in the first part of the movie, and then they move on to another car because the GTR gets crashed and impounded. So what do we do? Mitsubishi steps in because they had a relationship with Dodge back then. And they said, we're going to give you Mitsubishi Eclipse and a Spider, and we're going to give you Mitsubishi Evo 7s. So they intercepted four Evos that were headed to Europe for a rally team, and they sent that over to us. And so we had to put those cars in the movie. And so that this is the reason that the GTR only made like a couple of minutes of appearance. And then they shift over to the Mitsubishi Evo, which wasn't terrible. But all those cars that I list, we didn't actually need to go to buy all these cars. We already had many of these cars that were parked in the warehouse in Newhall, California. These were the cars that were left over from the first movie. I went to see them. I looked at all the cars. I said, these can be used, these can't be used, or we're gonna have to buy new ones to do modifications again. So the ones that we took, like the Supros and the RX-7s and the Eclipses from the first movie were reused in Too Fast, Too Furious. You see most of those cars in the warehouse scene, scramble scene, painted different colors, different wheels, different body kits, and all that kind of stuff. But none of those cars got to 
to be really used as main cars for the characters with the exception of the Slapjack Supra, which was reused from the first movie, and the uh, RX-7s for Orange Julius, which was used for Dominic Toretto in the first movie. And some of those cars now have the pedigree of being not one movie, but two movies. So what we needed for the GTRs, we needed four GTRs plus the jump car for a total of five GTRs. So in total, we needed five Nissan GTRs. So we went back to Motorex, it was still in business, and purchased four more GTRs. We paid $48,000 for each GTR. Yes, it came from overnight Japan. <laughs> it cost $13,000 to ship them in the cargo hold of a 747. Once the cars landed, they were basically went into Eddie Paul's workshop and El Segundo. They didn't even really start it except getting some parts together, body kits, and then they went to Florida where we were gonna build in the cars. So real quick, let's go over what each car was used for. When I'm talking about each car, I'm talking about the GTRs. We had five GTRs, okay? Here's how it went down. My car was the Hero One. It was number 37 on the key list. And if you've ever seen a picture car key list, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, it probably doesn't make sense to you, but you can probably figure it out. The next car was listed as principal number two. And this car was basically acting as a backup to my car. And this car was key list number 38. This car had a glowing brakes, which a gag we were gonna do for a sequence on the, the nighttime race, but it didn't work out. It was just basically ultimately cut out of the movie, which was terrible. I have a video of it experimenting with this. The third car was to be a stunt car, and it was a number 39, as I recall, on the key list. It had a flamethrower, and if I'm not mistaken, this car had tow tabs as well. And the next one is the third car, chosen to be principal number one. This one was number 40 on the key list. It too had a flamethrower setup. What was important about this car that this car got a lot of screen time with Paul Walker. And then we have uh, the fifth car, which is car number 25 on the key list, was a beautiful EV1 yellow GTR that came to us from Andy from Middlehurst Nissan in the UK. This car was immediately stripped inside and outside and rigged with a massive cage to protect the stunt driver. And so it was really sad to see that car pulled apart. <laughs> in this footage, you can see that the cars are now all painted and now they're getting into the nitty gritty. They don't have to install the stereos in those cars because it doesn't need it. it my car had the stereo, they didn't need it. Before we sent my GTR to Florida, the car was delivered to West Coast Customs for the audio video equipment. I had drew up a blueprint, uh, dropped it off with Ryan over there. This one, they were still in El Segundo. And in three weeks, it was all complete. And man, it was fantastic. It was an amazing thing. I couldn't quite wait to drive it home. Only my car got the functional audio video because like I said stunt cars don't need a lot I'm sorry to repeat this, but I'm gonna do it just once one more time. Let me make this very clear. All of the Skylines and Too Fast, Too and Furious were real GTRs. I don't know why people can't get this. In Fast 4, there was only one GTR that they used and the rest were GTTs. So I'm not sure how this rumor keeps going around, but I'll tell you a thousand percent, I have the paperwork, legit original paperwork on every one of them, then I can prove it. Another fact, out of all the GTRs used in Too Fast and Too Furious, only mine was legal in the United States because the other cars were brought in as props and they were on temporary import bonds. The Blackbird was the Motorex car, which was used to establish the process. So it was never in danger of being kicked out of the country or banished or anything like that. It was 100%. So what about the other cars? Well, let's take a look at what happened to the other cars after the movie, okay? <laughs> I sold my GTR to a place called Ride Revolution in Tennessee, which is also known as Motor Mavericks. They immediately stripped the car back to black. Well, that was a pain in the ass because now they have car four paint jobs. Um, they ripped out all of the audio video. Eventually the car was sold to a collector. I think it was a museum for a while or, or maybe we went straight to the guy in New Jersey who works on GTRs. I'm not gonna mention his name for privacy, but, but that's where it is. The jump car was for sale on eBay around 2012. I'm told the car resides in um, Washington state and that the car sold for something like $70,000, but I can't confirm that. Over the years that followed, at least two of these cars surfaced again. One or two maybe wound up in the car car museum. But the, the years from 2004 to 2013, nobody in the United States really cared about fast and furious cars. Nobody was talking to me about it. As a matter of fact, from 2004 to 2017, I never even talked about these movies until Paul Walker died. 2013, I've started hearing things about the GTRs. So during that period between 2004 and 2013, one of those GTRs sold for $24,000. But after Paul died, any car that Paul touched went up in value and it's still going today. I'll give you an example in just a second. Today, 
Universal Studios still owns at least one, and it has uh, been sitting outside for the tour people for about 15 years, and my math is right, at the Universal Studio tour in Hollywood, California. Paint got all faded. Just recently, thank God, it got a refurbishment. New paint, new graphics, cleaning up the interior, fixing some of the things that were in bad repair. Windows are now tinted very, very, very dark so that the sun won't come in and destroy the inside of it. One one of those cars found its way to Norway where a collector literally cut a hole in his roof of his house and then had a crane to gently pick it up and drop into his living room. <laughs> that car is in immaculate shape. I just got pictures of it not too long ago and having been stored in cold storage, literally, and shielded from any sunlight, this car is in impeccable shape. So as it stands, we know where three of the cars are, right? One is in Norway, my old car, is in New Jersey, one of the cars at Universal Studios in Hollywood, and there's a guy who has the jump car in Washington State, if my information is correct. There was a rumor that it was at Louisiana. I can't verify that, so I'm gonna stick with the Washington State. This is about the time, traditionally, when people who have been sitting on these cars might want to start thinking about cashing out. The economy is not doing very well. We're gonna be in an election year next year, and this is about how the people do it. They hang on for 10 to 20 years, and then they cash out. If any of those three GTRs would go and this was a question that got me to do this video. What do you think these cars are worth today? Uh, if I did some back of an envelope calculations and I'm thinking if the FF4 went for 1.3 and change uh, with fees, I have to think that it's possible that a, a Too Fast, Too Furious GTR could post up a, a bid close to that. I, I've heard, heard estimates like $750,000, a million dollars, a million five, two million, what is it gonna be? The only barometer we have is a couple years ago, a Supra that was used in the first movie and repurposed in the second movie, sold for $550,000 and it wasn't very accurate. The outside had the right stuff, definitely screen used, but it didn't have the audio video, didn't have nitrous and all that. The trunk was completely empty. So it was a different thing, but I said it was gonna sell about 500 or 600 or 550, so I got that one. So I don't wanna speculate because if that happens, I don't wanna be accused of like, cons you, know, you know, it's political and all that kind of stuff. So. But I can tell you this, what I am seeing is that the cars from the first two movies are commanding higher prices than most of the other cars from the other Fast and Furious movies. Not because the older cars are better, it's just that they were more interesting. All the cars that they're doing is dodge this, dodge this, dodge, dodge, dodge. All they have is roll cage and, and stuff in there for stuntmen. There's no stereo stuff. There's no character to the car. Maybe a giant fake blower sticking out of the hood, fake fuel cell or fake rocket engine. Everything you saw in the cars in the first two movies was real stuff. Audio systems, nitrous stuff. It's just a little different now. Or some people are just nostalgic and that's the way it goes. So if you're going to be looking at buying cars from the from the Fast and Furious movie, unless you're really in love and late model GTXs, uh, Dodge cars or anything, I think the cars that are gonna make the most money at auctions are gonna be the cars from the first two, maybe three. So that's it for this episode, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.